Sustainability. Perhaps the biggest problem that we face today. And in fact, it's an educational issue. Let's think a little bit about possible technical solutions. For one thing, um, there could be quite a number of these, and one of them is, say, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Efficient solar electricity production, genetically develop a wheat to fix its own nitrogen. We can think of hundreds of possibilities. And the scientific community is working pretty hard to solve many of these. However, we need to think further and more deeply, education-wise, and think about a sustainability quotient, which I call PSQ, NSQ. Aeroplanes, minus three. Central heating, minus three. Air conditioning, minus seven. These are massive drains on the sustainability of the, of the planet. And we need to change that attitude very carefully, make people aware of just what problems we're facing in the future. In fact, um, think of some other aspects. Local yogurt, foreign yogurt. How did the foreign yogurt get to where it's being sold? It came on a truck, a ship, a train. These are issues that are really quite serious in the future and have economic impact as well. I'll make only one exception, and it's for mozzarella di bufala. The only place where they make decent mozzarella is in Italy. Okay, saving the planet. That's what we're up to. It's a global citizenship problem. We can't do it alone. Everybody on the planet must actually lend a hand to do this. It's an educational issue. In fact, a global educational issue. There needs to be a new attitude of children, a reverence for not just the rainforests and trees, for wild animals. They must love them as much as they do their pets. And it goes deeper than that. We must set a good example as parents. We must recognize this fish is actually still alive. And in fact, just think about it. What if one took one's pet kitten, hooked it in the mouth and swung it round? The squealing, in fact. Fish can't squeal. They have no vocal cord. But they're in pain. We know that from neurological studies. These little children, would they be quite so happy if those fish that they're holding were squealing like their pet kitten? I'm not so sure. Father and son bonding. What sort of uh, should parents actually think about? Is this a good example to, for our children? What is this little boy about to shoot? What is he so happy seeing die? What about large fish like this? Are they going to eat all that fish? What about this sheep? It's not hard to shoot a sheep. What sort of pleasure have they got from that? There's another way. Another way to bring up our children, as is shown in these images. And in fact, these animals have been shot, but with a camera. Okay? That's the way to shoot animals. The value of science to society is not well understood. Negative things do happen, and the accidents will happen. However, by far the worst issues involving science are those that we can avoid. The armed conflict, the wars that are going on at the present time on our planet. In general, I think that society would really recognize that, that science, engineering, and technology have been of great benefit to us. Let's give some example. Anesthetics. There were no mobile phone cameras in those days. This gives you an idea of the horror of what it must have been like to have had an amputation uh, without an anesthetic. Women had breast surgery without anesthetics. There can be no more humanitarian contribution from chemistry to society than anesthetics. Penicillin. Penicillin. This molecule. A real miracle. You don't need to pray. Blood poisoning in 1942. A year early, this little girl would have died, but she was cured in three weeks with penicillin. And we need young people to realize that evolution is a fact, that there are bacteria evolving with an immunity to antibiotics. Think about it. We may be going back to this. We need brilliant young kids to actually try and solve this problem in the future. What about science? What about this? What would it be like without chemistry? Okay. All these things would disappear, one after the other. In fact, it's really quite interesting just how these sort of things have contributed to our life. Um, and without them, in fact, uh, life would be a lot different. And scientists, such as physicists, biologists, engineers, they could say very similar things. Without chemistry, that our life would be totally different. Science, what is it? Well, people don't fully appreciate science. There are several aspects to it. It's very important to recognize the differences between them. The first is it's a body of knowledge, a body of knowledge that we learn at school. Then there's the application of that knowledge, technology. And then 
Very importantly, there's the way that we discover new knowledge. All those, however, however important they are, are not as important as something else. Before science had the name science, it had another name, natural philosophy. And in the perception of most people, the value and importance of science to society has obscured the cultural and intellectual aspect of natural philosophy. By far the, far the most important aspect is that natural philosophy is the only philosophical concept we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. And the ethical purpose of education must be to teach our young people how they can decide what they're being told or what they discover is actually true. The teaching of a skeptical, evidence-based assessment of all claims without exception is thus a fundamentally intellectual integrity issue. Without evidence, anything goes. Think about it. The Royal Society what I was thinking about a motto. The first motto it thought of was quantum mechanics. What a lot we don't know. It's still the same today as it was in 1660. We know very little at the present time. We're continually learning. However, they chose another one, Nullius in Verba. Take nobody's word for it. I actually like this one better. I take no one's word with, or it, without evidence. Let's take an example. Here's one that many of you will know about it. Was it a goal? Or was it not a goal? I don't take the referee's word for it. Why don't I? Because there's evidence. There's evidence that it did cross the line. That's what our world can achieve today, evidence. And the problem is that there are three senses, common sense. Common sense tells us that the sun goes around the earth. Hmm. Don't agree with me? Well, in the morning it's over here. In the evening it's over there. Common sense tells me the sun goes around the earth. It's uncommon sense that tells us that the earth is actually turning on its axis, which makes it appear that the sun is going around us. Now, I'm just going to ask you, how many of you know the evidence for this? Usually not many people put their hand up. Sometimes no. In fact, how much else have you accepted without evidence? That's worth thinking about. Make a list of them all. In fact, most of you have accepted that the, sun goes around, that the earth goes around the sun without knowing the evidence for it. And you've accepted a lot more things as well. In fact, it's uncommon sense. The uncommon sense of Copernicus, Galileo, and Giordano and Bruno that tells us we must question everything very, very carefully. Examine all claims on the basis of evidence. It may take millennia to overcome the power of dogma. In fact, in the case of Galileo, 359 years, and in fact, um, Margarita Hack said, uh, better late than never. The trouble is, nonsense is common now, more than it ever was before. And that presents a problem as, the verge, as we are on the verge of sustainability issues, which are very, very serious. Climate change is a good example. Okay. What about it? Who cares? What about this fellow? Does he claim about climate change? We must examine the evidence for climate change. We mustn't say there is climate change or there isn't climate change. Is there more rainfall around the world? Is the average temperature rising? Are glaciers receding or advancing? Sea level, is that rising? Animals, are they moving from their natural habitat? Is there more or less CO2? Is there an increase or decrease in hurricanes? Is the Arctic and Antarctic, what's happening there? We must look at these indicators and come to an assessment ourselves of what's going on. Take no one's word for it. Don't take my word for it. Don't take a politician's. Don't take any scientist. Look at the evidence for yourself and make a decision for yourself. That's science and that's what we must do. And that's what we must teach everybody on the planet. Not to accept what vested interest tells them. Look at the evidence to decide for yourself. Perhaps as in important as anything else is the fact that very few people have really important, valuable mathematical ability. As an example, nurses, um, some of them don't know quite where to put the decimal point. They might get ten times more or ten times less medication than they should. If they're lucky, could be out by more than that. In 1999, between 50 and 100,000 deaths were recorded in the USA due to hospital errors, and many of them mathematical ones. Those are the issues we face. Now, there are many ways to get the message out there. 
And one is through our schools. In fact, in New Zealand, they had a very interesting project on plastic bags. They got the children to draw paintings about the dangers of, of, uh, to the environment of plastic bags. And the children painted little paintings and drawings, and these were really rather nice. Here are two of them. I like people who look after sea creatures. I like it when plastic bags are not near me. And these were put on canvas bags. And almost overnight, plastic bags disappeared from the supermarkets. And the parents were influenced by their children. We have a network to get to almost everybody on the planet through the children. And that we must exploit. I do kids' workshops all over the world. And in fact, uh, they've been very good from Japan to Santa Barbara in California, um, to Mexico, to Malaysia, to Iceland, by internet, across the whole of Australia, by internet, the UK, with Manchester United footballers. In fact, this little kid is the only person who's found me used for my Molecule C60. I've done them all over the world, as I say, by internet to Iceland. And the internet is our new weapon in this whole exercise. Here are the kids in Mexico that were actually excited to do science. I set up the Vega Science Trust some years ago to make programs for television. And in fact, it was really recognizing that there was a first revolution in education. And it was the printing press. Books democratized education. The second revolution is the internet, is democratized broadcasting. We pioneered a new concept in TV debate that participants should actually know something. We do the workshops, they're up on the web, we've got fantastic programs by Feynman. We discuss issues such as the fact that the embargo on DDT has condemned about a million children to death each year. We've got interviews with Joseph Rotblatt, major scientist who won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts with Pugwash to limit the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And people like Max Perutz, who obtained the structure of hemoglobin. But things has changed. What has changed? The encyclopedia. Now, how many of you have actually looked at an encyclopedia? Put your hand up. This week? Hmm, they all went down. This is a revolution. And that one must recognize that we have this new weapon, and it's a powerful one. And I call it the Guyu Wiki World on the Internet. Okay, Google, YouTube, and Wikipedia have transformed. It's a revolution, a triple revolution. And it, let's look at what we're now doing, okay? We use a capture station, capture station technology, the way I'm coming to you now, where we have a, a video of the, of the speaker or the teacher together with the data file, which could be PowerPoint or something else. It could be on a blackboard, and it could be downloadable. We can make this material available to every teacher on the planet. That is what we're doing through our GSF program. It's the future of broadcasting. Okay, there you go. And here are some of the sites that we have set up at the present time. What have we got? Well, we've got little presentations on, say, maps. Let's look at the world. Let's get children, small children in school understanding some of the problems that we face. Let's flatten the world. As we flatten it, Mercator realized that there was a problem, and he solved it. He took an orange, marked it out, cut along the lines, opened it up, opened it up, ate the fruit, flattened it out, and that's how he got his projection, what I call the orange peel projection of the map of the world. Mercator showed that if you didn't do this, you probably would end up with countries which were rather um, distorted in their sizes. If you put them on the icosahedron, it's a better one. It's not the one you're familiar with, but the, the country sizes are a lot better. There are ways of doing it. We teach algebra. Very, you can get little children of the age of six, seven, and eight can be taught algebra. We can take a cube and say, number of faces is f. f is equal to six. Kids of six can do this. Corners. How many corners? Eight. Kids of eight can do that. How many edges? Well, no problem. Kids of 12 can tell you the 12 edges. We can introduce an equation. Faces plus corners minus edges. Children of six, seven, eight have no problem in coming to the answer to six plus eight. 14 minus 12 is equal to 2. They fill this into the table. They take a pyramid and discover that the equation is generally applicable to structures of many, many kinds. Now, I'm going to introduce you to what we're doing with students. We found that students are just fantastic at teaching. 
Here is one of them. Here are the Beatles. George, John, Ringo, and Paul. We all know their music, and most of us even know of their impact on the world today. However, whether we realize it or not, we've had more contact with another type of Beatle, and they have had far more influence on our very lives. And I'm talking about these Beatles, the insects. And this presentation will be all about the wonderful world of Beatles. So why talk about bugs? They seem so ins insignificant and so unimportant. Well, first of all, the study of insects is an extensive branch in modern biological research. And for those chemically minded with us, there's plenty of interesting chemistry that goes on inside beetles. But the most important part of this presentation is to show you that beetles are actually very interesting creatures. And uh, not too many people know about beetles, so we're going to show you some interesting facts. And first of all, beetles are not bugs, they're insects. That was an undergraduate. Now I'm going to show you a graduate student. Hi, my name is Kerry Gilmore, and I am a graduate student here at Florida State University. I work for Dr. Al Bugen as a, an organic chemist. Now, I love organic chemistry because it provides you the opportunity to go through and be an architect, an engineer, a builder, because you can go through and you, we can really look at designing molecules, we can figure out how to actually make these molecules, and then finally, we actually get to go into lab and actually build these things. Now, the greatest organic chemist by far is nature. Nature can go through and take something as utterly simplistic as these small seeds and through a series of organic transformations using chemistry that we ourselves use, uh, it's able to go through and transform it into these beautifully complex and beautiful flowers that you can see here. Now, what we do is much the same. We'll take something relatively small, something relatively simplistic, and through a series of transformations, we need to figure out how to make something that's much larger, much more complex. And that's the goal of organic chemistry, is to go through and try to find this bridge between these two things, to try and take different molecules and piece them together, and in doing so, form something that can be useful, uh, in this case, taxol. Now, that was a graduate student, and we're finding that graduate students, undergraduates, and kids at school are fantastic at making presentations because they have something special. They have enthusiasm for the projects that they're involved with. In fact, we're finding as important as educational experience and teaching experience, enthusiasm is equally important. And in fact, it's really rather good because let's look and think about assessment. In instead of a pile of paper like this, marking this, I'm here in in England with a glass of wine marking my students and thoroughly enjoying their presentations. It's not only a revolution in project reports, but also a revolution in marking and assessment. And in fact, if you think about assessing EU proposals, such as a uh, sort of research proposal, this would be a fantastic way of doing it in the future. We've actually um, revolutionized this, the resume. Instead of a resume being a pile of paper about there, what we're doing is putting our students right on top of the pile so that, in fact, people who are assessing them know much more about them. We're not only uh, conflating this, they're improving the resume or the CV room by a factor of 10. It is the future, and it's a no-brainer, and I think inevitable in the future. Just to show you that it works, here's our Hall of Fame. Kerry Gilmore, who you've seen, he got a Fulbright scholarship to Italy. Steve Aqua uh, put together a very nice presentation on this Geoset project, and we got a Rich Media Award for it. Prajna, this was the first student, as I recorded, and she got a postdoctoral fellowship almost immediately. She got four tenure track awards, and when she got to the university that she is now at, they said, we could see from your presentation that you could teach. And just recently, in the last 10 days, she sent me an email to say that their university has just been awarded a major contract for educational outreach. And in fact, she was put in charge of this because the head of department had seen her GSET recording. This works and is the future for scholarships and for young people getting jobs, but also for adding to the cache of educational material out there. Brittany said, getting into medical school, Geoset 
was the defining factor. Jeff said it was real fun doing it and it helped me get my job. Our trees, she got down for an interview down in the local government office and when she walked in they said we've already seen your presentation and we really enjoyed it. She was already halfway to getting the job. Vinny you've seen, you haven't seen Brian but and you haven't seen uh, Jennifer, but they're all the young people helping to create this fantastic cache of material. I just learned from Japan that Watanabe Noriyuki, um, he got his job through his GSET presentation. Here are the people helping me. Steve Aqua, Sam Rustin, Colin Byfleet and Penny Gilmer. These are the people that are behind this sort of project. And we're working with other universities to develop this and create nodes in lots of other countries. Well, let's think about the final aspect of sustainability. This is my favorite animal now. And you know what it's sitting on. Yes, a ball of elephant crap. It is actually a sustainability animal. It is recycling this crap. But let's look at our world. What is the crap that we've produced? This is a field in England with 140,000 refrigerators just dumped there. We've got to recycle our own crap. We don't have dung beetles. We've got to develop our own robots to do this and make sure that we have a sustainable world. Some of you may know, but I design logos, and this is my logo for a sustainable world in the future. This is the future that we must think about. I have one or two last things to say. The first is, I want to show you this poster. It's my favorite poster. It says, I'm an alien creature. I was sent from another planet with a message of goodwill to you from my people. The message says, dear Earth people, when you finally at last destroy your planet and have no place to live, you can come and live with us. And we will teach you how to live in peace and harmony. And we will give you a coupon good for 10% off all deep dish pizzas too. Sincerely, Bob. Three things. Destroying the planet. I'm not sure. The evidence doesn't look good. I'm a scientist. I can never be totally sure. It depends on which day, what evidence I'm looking at. It doesn't look good. Peace and harmony. I am sure about this. Isn't it incredible that we cannot solve our problems today without um, sending young people to go and kill each other? Why is it that we have politicians who cannot sit down at a table and solve our problems? There are only about 250, 350 of them. It is incredible. That's a problem that we should be able to solve overnight. But then, the pizza. Sense of humor. Without a sense of humor, life really isn't worth living as far as I'm concerned. I get Rolling Stone. And then Leonard Cohen said, I don't consider myself a pessimist. I th think a pessimist is someone who is waiting for it to rain. And I feel soaked to the skin. Well, that's pessimism. Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs>